Welcome to Hot Chips 24. Session 4. Multimedia and Imaging. I'm uh, Samir Nanavati from Qualcomm, and I'm going to be uh, chairing the uh, multimedia and imaging uh, session, the next two talks. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a change of pace now. Uh, we, we're going to go from GPUs and CPUs to uh, SOCs. If you attended uh, yesterday's wonderful tutorial on SOC programming, you must have heard from uh, a couple of uh, application developers we were talking about uh, these compelling use cases that they're working on in augmented reality, hand gestures, uh, eyesight recognition. Um, and you also heard them uh, demanding hardware capabilities for uh, image processing and, and, and vision. Uh, so the next two talks uh, are about vision processes and um, outlines the architectures and the design choices that uh, they're making to address this uh, these new uh, use cases. The first speaker is uh, Robert Bushy from um, Analog Devices. Robert is uh, currently a principal architect and technologist in the uh, DSP core products group at uh, Analog Devices. Robert got his uh, uh, MSEE degree from University of Southern California's Viterbi School of Engineering. Robert has uh, 20 years of experience with Hitachi Hewlett Packard and analog devices, and he has uh, several patents in um, the fields of uh, image processing and high performance computing. And uh, Robert's experience spans the uh, entire product's life cycle, all the way from um, customer requirements and gathering to technical analysis, SOC architecture, RTL design, verification, and releasing these uh, devices to high volume uh, production. So uh, please uh, welcome me in, um, join me in welcoming uh, Robert. Thank you, Samir. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I'll be discussing analog devices, uh, BF60X vision focused system on a chip, and also our all new pipeline vision processor. First, a few words about analog devices. We're about a $2.7 billion company. We've been around a little over 40 years. Uh, and I want to note off the top that this has truly been a cross-organizational, cross-geographical uh, development effort. And design centers from uh, Beijing to uh, Bangalore, India, all the way across Europe, North America, uh, Australia. It's really a, a global effort that went into producing this, um, this device. Organized into roughly two groups, a core products and technology groups organization and a strategic markets a segments group. I come out of the processors and digital signal processing, CPT. And our, our CPT did most of the development of the device in collaboration with um, most of the strategic market groups. Two of the fo uh, focal groups that we worked with for primary market segments were automotive and industrial. Um, and then, we, so we have an automotive focus to the device in the ADAS, Automotive uh, Driver's Assistance Systems market. And then we also have a general industrial view uh, of things like machine vision, applications like machine vision. But we also have a GP component which cuts really across all the markets. So we've architected and defined the device to meet the requirements across many markets and many, many applications. So the the BF60X family of devices that we just recently introduced uh, is at the high end of our Blackfin family. It has two uh, Blackfin DSP instruction level processors and the pipeline vision, what I, what I refer to as function level processor. A little bit about the ADAS market. Um, when we talk about ADAS, we talk about reducing traffic fatalities and automobile accidents worldwide. 
and reducing accidents generally. Uh, there's three general uh, categories of technologies that we talk about, radar, LIDAR, and vision. The focus of today's talk is on vision, although I will say that the three groups of technologies are used in complementary ways and redundant ways to gather uh, meaningful and uh, accurate information about the surroundings of the automobile. <clears throat> the, the vision processing applications that we typically try to map onto a device like the BF60X are applications like lane departure warning, traffic sign recognition, pre-collision warning, these kinds of applications. Um, and when we start to look into the requirements that these applications drive, what we find is that at high resolution, high frame weight, which is required innately due to the speed of the automobile and the real-time safety criticality of the applications, what we find is we have to perform uh, at 1080, at, at, I'm sorry, high definition resolution, we'll say this, up to 1280 by 960 by 30 frames per second. If you do the math, that comes out to about 37 megapixels per second. But it's a little more computationally complex than that because we're actually uh, computing pixel operations concurrently, both in parallel and in serial in a pipeline fashion. So when you do the full calculation, it comes out to over 25 billion operations per second that's required real time to be executed to satisfy the requirements of the, of the ADAS applications. And we try to map multiple ADAS applications onto a single device, and I'll talk more about that. Um, but in addition to, be, to, to, addition, in addition to the performance requirements, of many billions of operations per second, we have very tight power constraints. And we've architected the device to, to run at a worst case one watt, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is uh, cost in terms of thermals and packaging, um, and the other is just raw power consumption. So we have the low power requirements, the low costs uh, as well, so we can't just throw an array of uh, instruction level processors at the problem, we have to actually roll our sleeves up and define some uh, dedicated hardware that's somehow programmable and configurable enough to meet the, um, the, the market requirements and the, and the software uh, community's requirements, as well as meeting the uh, computational requirements. Now, low bandwidth, as we all know, leads to uh, low cost and low power. In many of our use cases, we find that the lion's share of the power consumption is the I.O. switching power, and so we, we really have gone to great lengths to reduce bandwidth uh, it also reduces the overall power consumption, which leads, again, to lower cost packaging options. So the BF609 highlights, we have a new uh, pipeline function level vision processor, and I refer to it as a function level processor because it's programmed at the function level rather than the instruction level. So you can think of this as programming it at a higher level. And we, we um, in addition to the uh, function level processor, we have two Blackfin instruction level processors, so the processing is shared between the function level processor and the instruction level processors, or between the PVP and the black fins. We also have the feature-rich uh, feature peripheral set and the connectivity options you'd expect to find in this class of device. We've added a, a number of uh, safety features. We're trying to achieve ASIL compliance, which is the automotive uh, safety uh, standards, and so we've added Parity ECC, a system protection unit that helps us to require, uh, recover from uh, various fault conditions, and this is, um, again, rem reminding that this is, these are safety critical applications we're trying to execute on the device. And a final note on power, this really demonstrates the low power needs uh, requirements. We've really targeted this device in a medium workload to be, um, to be at about uh, uh, 400 milliwatts, medium workload typical conditions, in worst case around a watt. Um, this is a block diagram of the device. We have, again, the two Blackfin cores, tightly coupled L1 memories to the cores. We have what we call a system level L2 that shares vision data structures between the video subsystem, which is highlighted in red, and the instruction level processors. And then we have the, 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 the uh, video subsystem itself, which is comprised of the PVP, as well as a, what we call a pixel compositor, which does basic alpha blending color space conversion, as well as our three EPPIs, and those are our video interfaces. And those can be used to connect to sensors or cameras on the input, as well as LC LCD kinds of devices for the output. The device has also been architected and defined to, to, to yield uh, low-cost printed circuit board solutions for many-way processing. So if you want to scale up the number of cameras or whatnot, you can do so. Uh, we use link ports or EPPI for our data communication between chips. 
and then serial ports or GPIOs for control. This is a top level depiction of our architecture. Um, we have many masters in our system. And again, this is real time uh, safety critical kind of uh, application. So we can't afford to miss any requests, reads or writes going into the crossbar coming back. So we've taken great care to choose uh, best arbitration and prioritization policies across the system crossbar to meet those requirements. Um, some masters have very high bandwidth, but they're latency sensitive. Some masters are very latency critical or latency sensitive. So we have to meet all those requirements concurrently across multiple applications um, at, the, at, the system, at the system level. Now, if I zoom in and look a little bit about uh, at the video subsystem itself, we've gone to great lengths to institute or implement what we call a uh, pixel crossbar, which allows us to pixel pipe data directly from IP block to IP block within the video subsystem without ever going to memory. So for example, we can bring data into the video interface, route it directly to the pixel compositor, and then route it directly to the PVP. So in effect, we can achieve billions of operations per second of vision pixel processing and never touch our memory subsystem. And that's critical for us for, for many reasons. The cost and power are the two biggest. If I broaden the view a little bit and look at the, um, the video subsystem coupled with the memory subsystem, what we see is in most use cases, video would come in directly from the sensor. In the ADAS market, it would be a front-mounted camera. The data would come into the video interface, be pixel piped directly to the Pixie, for example, then down directly to the PVP. And so in most cases, the data is decimated or you're operating at a region of interest level by the time you ever get to the memory subsystem. So the point here is we never take high def video, high, high frame rate video to and from memory. So and in addition to that, in, in many use cases, the data coming in, we can only, once it's decimated through the processing and the lion's share of the processing is done in the front end in the, in the uh, video subsystem, the resultant data structures then would be sent out to either the L2 system SRAM or directly into a tightly coupled L1 memory so that the DSP instruction level processor course can take the processing through the back end of the vision pipe, which is typically implemented in the, uh, in the uh, instruction level uh, Blackfin processors. So the PVP again is used for, uh, is targeted at ADAS applications, but also industrial applications. And it was architected in conjunction with many of our tier one customers. Uh, and so we mapped a lot of the market requirements and the technical requirements that were derived from the market requirements, as well as a general domain knowledge or domain understanding of classical imaging and vision processing. So we've architected it in a very flexible way to meet many market requirements, many applications requirements, yet very efficiently. <clears throat> this is a top level diagram of the pipeline vision function level processor. So we have several degrees of flexibility and programmability built into the definition of the architecture. So the first, the first point I want to make is you can map or you can allocate various blocks to various applications. So let's say you want to map a couple of convolution blocks to a given application. And let's say you want to map, map uh, you want to allocate the threshold front length encode unit to a second application. You can do that. So the way this works is you program the function level processor at the function level and you allocate functions across applications. Okay, so that's the first degree of flexibility. The second degree of flexibility is within the context of each function, there's a tremendous amount of programmability and configurability. So we've mapped, again, many applications onto the, onto the architecture and onto the definition such that there's the necessary configurability and programmability to meet many, many requirements um, and yet very efficiently. And then the third degree of flexibility is how you route the data. So you allocate the functional blocks program the given functional blocks to achieve the right functionality for your given application that you've, you've allocated the, the block to. And then finally, you, you hook up the connectivity. You can route the pixel pipes. So the key point here is you can map to mul map allocate multiple functions across multiple applications, do billions of operations of processing before you ever touch the memory subsystem. And that's why we can achieve such a low power and low, and, and low cost. <clears throat> So just to highlight a couple of the key blocks within the PVP, we have 2D convolution. Most of these blocks are very commonly used in vision applications and image processing. So we have a, a, a 
two, we have four total 2D convolution blocks that can support up to five by five convolution. And again, those can get mapped across multiple applications. We have an ALU that has all the types of functions you'd expect in an ALU. It's, to, it's architected a little bit differently to take advantage of pixel pipelining from a performance point of view. Um, we have a Cartesian to polar block, which is again, another key function that's very compute intensive at the instruction level processor side, but we've just implemented the function here in PVP. We have an edge classification block. Usually in most vision applications, you start by uh, edge classification, whether you're using a Sobel, uh, Sobel type scheme or algorithm or a canny type scheme or algorithm. Um, so edge classification is key in terms of classifying the orientation of edges and then packing is for DMA efficiency. We do thresholding. Uh, so for high beam, low beam applications, we'll do quantiza quantization of pixel values into, into bins so we can find, bites, find bright spots in images um, which allows us to do, uh, to, to implement the high beam, low beam uh, type of functionality. And again, we can allocate that block just to that application and free up the rest of the PVP for other applications. Uh, we have the uh, integral image block, which does what the sound, the name sounds like. It sums across and down image, again, a key function for many vision applications. So let's take a look, case at a, look, a look at a use case view of an ADAS, set of ADAS applications where we're mapping uh, high beam, low beam, and lane departure warning. So what we're doing here is we're allocating, we're allocating the threshold coding block, the THC block, to the high beam, low beam application. We're allocating two convolution blocks, the pixel magnitude unit and the pixel edge classification unit to the lane departure warning application. Um, and then we're configuring the data path such that the data flows in from the camera through the video interface, gets, gets piped directly to the threshold code unit and also gets concurrently broadcast to the two convolution units where the X and Y components of the Sobel algorithm are calculated, and then the, the data streams downstream ultimately out to L2. Now, I want to make the point here that in this case, we're, we're, we're mapping two extremely high performance, many gig ops worth of processing uh, onto the function level processor, and the resultant data structures are only going to L2, so we're using zero L3 bandwidth in, in, in this mapping. So in other words, we're able to achieve on the order of 15 billion operations per second with no L3 bandwidth. As I mentioned earlier, the data structures are actually decimated at this point, and so they're small enough to fit into the L2. And then the L2, from the L2, the instruction level Blackton processors can, can finish out the, uh, the vision processing pipeline from there. This is another use case view in the industrial space. Uh, we recently introduced uh, the BF60X family worldwide and I was in Vegas at the time. We had a little bit of fun with this. It was a, it was a dice rolling application where we took, you know, we, we, we sh shook and rolled the dice and then we had a dot counting application. We pro it's probably, the bf 6 x is probably a little bit of overkill for this particular application. But what I want to point out here is that the, we were able to implement and execute the canny edge detection on a 720 by 480 at 60 frames per second in an embedded, very low power, very low cost kind of uh, scenario, which is un unprecedented, really. Um, it's easy to do it on, on, on large <laughs> PCs, and stuff, but in an embedded environment, it's quite challenging. So we were able to do that. And then the lower pipe, so the upper pipe's the hardware pipe. Again, we've allocated the input formatter, which is the in input. We can do things like stripping off red, green, or blue. We can do a lot of pixel operations in the input formatter. Then the data is sent to the first convolution block, broadcast to the, to the, to the two additional convolution blocks in parallel, and then to the pixel magnitude angle unit, the pixel edge classification unit, and out to DMA. And then it's picked up from there by the instruction level, the Blackfin cores, and again, the rest of the pipe is executed in a single instruction level Blackfin core. So the lion's share of the processing happens uh, in the upper pipe, the hardware pipe, and then it's handed down to the inst instruction level processors to, to finish out the processing. So just a couple of quick words about power. So traditionally, going back 20 years, you know, we've always tried, in most vision and imaging kinds of ASICs or SOCs, we've tried to go wider at lower frequency to conserve power. But as we go to finer pitch geometries, we look at 65, 40, 28, what we're finding is leakage dynamics are changing that a little bit. So we did get some nonlinearity when we look at this, but in the case of, well, we're still at 65 nanometer LP for this product. And in this case, we decided to go wider. Um, so what we're showing here is that a 25 Mac architecture uh, running at 50 megahertz uh, is um, more power efficient than a 5 Mac architecture running at 250 megahertz. 
And so we ultimately implemented in the low power process, TSMC 65 nanometer low power process. Um, and again, market requirements, technical requirements drove us into that process. And what we came up with was the ability to execute uh, 25 max at 50 mega megahertz, which yielded 13.8 watts, milliwatts total, total power, which comes out to 5G max at 55 milliwatts. Watts. And zero bandwidth again. Remember, all this vision processing is happening without even touching the memory subsystem. And, uh, and that really helps us here because it, it would triple, it would literally triple these power numbers if we factored in um, IO switching, you know, and depending on how many times we'd have to go back and forth to memory like we do on a classic instruction level processor uh, for, for, for processing, doing vision processing at a higher definition that won't fit local on the chip. Uh, so where caching doesn't help us. And so the, the bottom line here is we can achieve a, a number of 11 milliwatts per GMAC of vision processing which is pretty phenomenal in this process. And if you compare that to a, a classic DSP or any of our DSPs, it, it's a phenomenally low number. So just a few words about the software architecture. This is something that people get nervous about. So on the left, you'll see there's, it's a typical software stack. At the top level, we have the application software. At the low level, we have the PVP hardware. So we've done a number of things to ease the programming burden for, for, for vision programmers and, and image, image processing programmers. So in the middle there, you'll see a couple few boxes. Those are our toolboxes. So those are high-level function or library bo boxes. And those were originally designed for and, and in use today on our Blackfin instruction level processors. But we've gone to great length to map many of those toolbox high-level toolbox high functions down into our PVP hardware so, it, so that the software programmers can seamlessly use these same functions they've used in software, same APIs, and yet achieve much more sophisticated algorithms and or higher, uh, higher uh, resolution and frame rate on the, on the vision processing. Uh, we've also taken other steps like we've mapped man, many of the OpenCV API calls. For, for those that are familiar with OpenCV, it's an open standard. We've mapped uh, many of those calls. It's, it's, it's not a direct mapping, but it's a rough mapping. And so those that are familiar with OpenCV programming can use those APIs. We don't always implement all of the API parameters, but the spirit of the APIs are there. And oftentimes, if you just implement it directly with those OpenCV calls, you can achieve the same processing you would achieve in a, in a Windows kind of environment. Uh, this is just a list of, the, uh, of some of the functions that we have in our various toolboxes. We have an ADAS toolbox. We have a, a, like more like a video surveillance and security kind of toolbox. And we have a general image processing toolbox. We have a number of toolboxes that are really mapped to different markets. So I want to conclude with just a few comments, uh, takeaways. So I believe that the best way to achieve an optimal architecture is to both work closely with customers, have a, a real uh, strong understanding of customer requirements, as well as having a domain, technical domain experience uh, and understanding and blending the technology with the market requirements to come up with an optimal architecture. Oftentimes I see people in the, in the marketplace trying to map uh, very computationally complex vision applications onto classical hardware, trying to force fit a market requirement that really doesn't fit on, on say a certain kind of solution. And so we've tried to balance those two and really try to take into account where technology is, what we can do with technology, but also what, what our customers are telling us they want. And I think we were successful in kind of blending those two, meeting many customer requirements while also implementing um, the, the best practices and latest technologies. The other thing is the hardware software IP partitioning. I think there's more and more pressure on us. We just can't, as we go to higher resolution, higher frame rate, more computationally complex kinds of tasks, you just can't get it done without going to very high power types of solutions. So partitioning between the hardware that you've implemented in the SOC and the, and the instruction level processing is important to have a balance there. Um, and then in vision applications, video applications, it's critical to route the data very carefully, both at the video subsystem level uh, and also at the chip level, so that you absolutely minimize memory, memory subsystem access uh, and really optimize the vast majority of processing around on-chip uh, types of processing. Um, <clears throat> Here I'm talking about many systems on chip architectures um, will require the functionality 
um, across markets, across a lot of applications. So our challenge as architects is to architect solutions that are optimized for specific applications within specific markets while still being appealing across many markets and many applications. And I think with the 60X, we've done that pretty well. We've, we have a really optimal solution for our customers in specific applications, and yet we have a very broad appeal when you talk about general imaging and so on. Um, and the next is really about partitioning, a, a, a kind of an extension of the partitioning discussion, and how it's very important to offer flexibility where flexibility is required. So the, the flexibility that comes with instruction level processing is very compelling um, in many systems, and from a risk point of view, and so on. But I think having a balance between the software instruction level processing, something like a function level processor, which is something that would reside in the middle of the flexibility optimization kind of scale, and then having functions like um, H H.264 encode at high def, you know, in dedicated IP. So I think having the partitioning between dedicated IP, semi-flexible, semi but still having, uh, the still performing optimally, yet having some flexibility and then ultimate flexibility, having the balance. And then the arbitration and prioritization at the, at the system level of the data when you have many masters in real-time applications, critical as most of us know. Um, and the algorithms that you employ at the DDR controller, in our case we found, because it was so critical that we didn't miss a single request, became paramount. So for us at least, a memory controller on the on the DM, on the on the DRAM, um, and then the op arbitration prioritization across the chip to the mini masters, and making sure that you have a, a complete understanding of what all the varied master requirements might be, uh, is 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 most important. So to finish, my email is robert.bushy at analog.com. Feel free to follow up with me. I'll try to put you in touch with uh, whoever you might uh, need like to talk with. Um, I want to point you to analog.com. There's a tremendous amount of information there. Uh, Blackfin Modules talks a lot about uh, all the libraries and toolkits that I talked about today. Um, the Blackfin, if you're interested, maybe maybe this isn't the right device, but you're interested in Blackfin in general, we have a big uh, page on that with tables to help guide. And then, um, and then automotive, as I said, the automotive is comprised of multiple technologies. I talked today about vision, but we have some really nice offerings in radar in, in there as well. So analog, uh, automotive.analog.com is a great, great source of information as well. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. We have time for questions. I guess folks didn't have enough uh, coffee. I can't hear you. Real application. What's that? Real application. Was the question, can you give some examples of some applications? Real applications. Maybe so, in the automotive field. Yeah, so, so, th so the two big, big, the primary markets in the vision space today are automotive and ADAS, which are, as I mentioned, things like traffic sign recognition, lane departure warning, pre-collision warning, high beam, low beam, just a smarter automobile. So using vision technologies, making the automobile smarter, uh, in many ways, so many applications. So we already have, we've already deployed solutions into that space with our 561 product in the software domain, and this really just strengthens uh, our, our offering, our solution to those players in the ADAS space. Uh, we also have customers in the in the industrial space for mach machine vision, for example, barcode reading, that sort of thing. Um, and then we have a GP, just j just general GP uh, component that really slices across. Uh, cla kind of classic image processing. So again, many of these functions that we've implemented in the function, the, the pipeline uh, vision processor are applicable across uh, many, many markets, many, many applications, vision-wise, image. So I can understand what lane detection is, but what is high beam, low beam? So high beam, low beam is he headlight, headlight detection. So it's automatic, so you're approaching another automobile and you're trying to detect whether you should switch from high beam to low beam. So automatically, yeah. So the, all this is all about automotive intelligence, yeah. The question was about camera specifications for uh, these applications. 
So for lane departure, you're talking about the resolution of the camera. So, so, so what we typically, so, so right now we're at lower resolution, so QVGA or, or in that range. But as we're moving forward in the next generations, we'll be going to higher def kind of resolution. So that's why we support up to 1280 by 960. Um, Omnivision, some of the, le all the leading uh, um, sensor vendors su su supply into the automotive market. And there's a whole array depending on uh, which supplier to which automotive OEM, so there's a whole array of, of specs out there, which is, which is one of the challenges, not only the specs themselves, but also the connectivity to those sensors. Uh, whether it's native LVDS directly to the sensor, there's some sensor vendors have their own standards, so there's tremendous challenges around connectivity there as well that, we, that, we've, tr that we've actually started to talk a lot about it and to address. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, Robert. The um, next uh, topic is also on um, heterogeneous SOCs for uh, image processing applications. This time it's from uh, Toshiba. The um, presentation is by uh, Masato Uchiyama. He is currently in the uh, SOC team at Toshiba, focusing on processors and real-time system architectures. Uchiyama-san obtained his bachelor's and master's degree in uh, information and computer science from Kaio University. And uh, since 2002, he has been working on SOC development at Toshiba. In the first six years in joining the company, his main work was related to processor architectures. In the next three years, he worked on development of media codecs, and applied and acquired knowledge of image processing. And uh, for the last two years, he's been working on image processing um, software. So please welcome um, Masato Ukiyama. Thank you, Samir. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Masato Ukiyama, a <coughs> software engineer. Working in a Toshiba Digital Media SOC department. Uh, it is great to be here. Today, <coughs> I'd like to present Viscon P2, a heterogeneous match core SOC for email recognition application. <coughs> this is the outline of my presentation. First, I'd like to talk about an overview of the Viscom T2 architecture and Kohog accelerator. <coughs> then, I'll talk about a couple of real applications. Background. Email recognition technologies are used in a variety of products and applications. This T2 is an SOC designed for those <coughs> email recognition applications, including automotive, consumer, industrial, and other products. This slide shows the requirements and our design approaches for Viscon T2. Major requirements are high accuracy, high performance, and low power. For high accuracy purpose, we introduce a Toshiba original image feature descriptor called Koho. <coughs> I will explain it later. For high performance with low power, we implemented several hardware accelerators. <coughs> In the area such as automotive, 
we have to cool LSIs without a cooling fan. Therefore, power consumption is limited under one watt in a typical condition. Next, let's have a brief look at the Viscon T2 architecture and Kohog accelerator. This is the block diagram of Viscon T2. As you see on the figure, a multi-core subsystem and six hardware accelerators are integrated. To keep enough memory bandwidth, four banks of on-chip SRs are also integrated and connected via a crossbar switch. <laughs> this is configuration of the much core subsystem. It consists of four three-way VLW cores. And <coughs> It is quite convenient for exploiting multi-level parallelism. Instruction level, thread level, and data level. This subsystem deals with various programmable tasks which cannot be handled by hardware accelerators described in the next slide. Let's take a look at hardware accelerators. <coughs> As I mentioned before, we implemented six hardware accelerators for fixed and frequently used tasks. The Kohog accelerator uh, <coughs> will explain it later. The matching accelerator is designed for template matching operation. The histogram accelerator is for histogram calculation of uh, image data. The affine accelerator is for coordinate transformations, <coughs> such as affine transformation. The filter accelerators are for filtering operations, such as edge detection. To explore a balance between high performance and low power, we took a highly parallelized approach rather than a high clock frequency approach. Cohog is the key component in Viscon T2. So I'd like to explain some more details about the Cohog accelerator in the following slides. Cohog is an extension to the widely used image feature descriptor, HOG. HOG carries much more <coughs> information than HOG does, leading to higher accuracy that HOG cannot achieve. The top right figure is an example. It is difficult to distinguish these objects by using hog descriptor. In contrast, it is easy to distinguish them by using cohog descriptor. However, calculating cohog requires many more operations. <clears throat> oh. 
Fallout requires about 160 operations per pixel. By adapting the highly parallelized approach, Hohog Accelerator can execute the, the operations in a single cycle. From the higher level viewpoint, it is equivalent to 400,000 ROIs per second. Good enough performance for our target applications. This slide shows the features and the chip micrograph of Bitcoin T2. The four accelerators, namely Kohog, Affin, Histogram, and Matching Accelerator, are implemented in this area. Bitcoin D2 achieves high peak performance of 464 GOTS. And its peak performance is 620 GOTS power. Now, I'd like to, so, <coughs> I'd like to show you two real applications. As examples, monocular pedestrian detection and hand gesture user interface. <coughs> pedestrian detection is an application for alerting a driver or braking a car automatically. Upon detecting pedestrians, in the front view camera. There are two types of camera configuration, stereo and monocular. A monocular camera system is cost effective, but needs much more calculations than than a stereo system. <laughs> this is the processing flow of pedestrian detection. First, a number of scaled images are made from input image using the affine engine. After that, the scaled images are translated to gradient orientation images using a filter engine. Then, Hohog based recognition is executed using gradient orientation images. Next, detected pedestrians are tracked by template matching scheme using the matching engine. Finally, all results are merged, and distances and velocities of pedestrians are calculated. This application utilizes one, two, three, four accelerators and the magical processor. And this step, recognized using Kohog, is the heaviest task in this flow. So, I'd like to see some more in the next slide. For pedestrian detection, quite a large number of Kohog calculations is are necessary. <clears throat> to detect pedestrians in different distances, different body height, different positions in an image. But 
our COHOG accelerator has enough performance of 400,000 ROIs per second. These graphs show how Visconti 2 outperforms a general purpose embedded 1 GHz CPU. The bottom bar, <coughs> bottom bar shows a breakdown of the Visconti 2 execution, which focuses on the hardware accelerators. Visconti 2 can execute this application 50 times as fast as a 1 GHz CPU with the aid of highly utilized accelerators. <coughs> the next example is hand gesture user interface, in which hand gestures are detected and interpreted to control digital products. OHOG is extensively used for detec detection of a hand. The processing flow of the hand gesture UI looks like this. Here, we have two different modes, direction and tracking. This application also utilizes three accelerators and the much core processor in this flow. <coughs> there are two sets of bar graphs, detection mode and tracking mode. These bars show how Visconti 2 again outperforms a 1 GHz CPU. In both modes, real time execution is achieved. This slide shows the power consumption of the example applications. Please note that the total power consumption is less than one watt, which implies no cooling fan is required. Let me conclude my presentation. Visconti 2 is um, email recognition SOC and achieves high accuracy, high performance, and low power. With the Cohog accelerator and the other hardware accelerators. Now, Engineering samples are ready for customers. Please check this URL to get more information about Visconti 2. Thank you for your kind attention. <coughs> Thank you.
you, Ms. Otto. Any questions? Okay, if not, uh, thank you again. That ends the multimedia and imaging uh, session. Thanks.